we can start. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, both here and at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome to, to, to the, uh, the Amsterdam Center for European Studies sponsored lecture series uh, on the future of the common European asylum system. Uh, I'm Jeroen Dominic, and I had the pleasure to organize and convene these lectures. Um, all the lectures, at least so far, are or have been recorded, and you can visit them and listen to them. The two first ones, Gerard Klaus and Martin Wagner, uh, they both focused on the state level, the national politics, and European politics, uh, which of course is essential if you want to study the common European asylum system. But it shouldn't be, we shouldn't forget that the state is only one level at which you can look at, at migration and asylum policies, uh, because the effects of migration may differ tremendously if you go down one or two steps to the regional level or the local level. Just imagine the region that we can observe, uh, even in a small country like the Netherlands, between regions, uh, it, it matters where you end up as a refugee. It matters where you end up down south or up north. Uh, and it also matters, of course, within regions, where you end up in a large city, or in a town, or in a rural location. And for this last part of this question, we've invited Birgit Lulz, who came all the way from Chemnitz, uh, which is in, located in Saxonia. Far in east, away. Far away in the east of Germany. <laughs> so we're really grateful that she made it. So Professor Lulz is Professor at, at, at Technical University in Kenya, uh, Professor for Social no, Human Geography, uh, and in the regional, what, what, what's the name of your department? I keep forgetting, it's regional planning? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's European Studies and History. Oh, that's the one, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and speaking of, I go back a long way. Yes. Um, and we co edited this book, and the title will already, you know, Sound like the kind of talk we're going to uh, to hear Absolutely. this afternoon. Absolutely, it's, it's a brief right. summary. What I will want to do. This book, by the way, is uh, open access. It's Springer, so so you don't need to buy it. You can simply go online and read it. Although hard copy, I mean, I, it's nice. Right? It's nice. Yeah. Anyway, without further ado, take it. Thank you very much, and um, I'm really glad to be here um, in a real place and uh, to yeah to also be in Amsterdam in that nice uh, weather. Um, I will check if I manage to do everything. Just one question: If uh, further people enter the waiting room, uh, will you manage that from there? Uh, we have to say that it's on a one week Ah, okay, and, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. So I can start without further. Delay and um, maybe just for the for our digital uh, visitors, um, I won't be able to read the comments while I'm speaking. So um, we will do it afterwards, right? Okay. Okay. Good. So yes, I will talk about rural arrival, um, which is something special uh, in Germany, um, and I will um, in a minute explain you what is so special about it. And uh, as Jerome just introduced, this is somehow the bottom of the multi-level governance system. And when we deal with the practicalities of refugee reception, we always realize that this bottom level seems to be the most important because that's where the people really arrive and where they have their first experiences and uh, have to settle down and have to start a new life. So it um, makes, sense to, to focus on that a little bit. And um, for migration studies, we know that we usually have a large urban agglomeration in mind when we, when we do our research or when we also talk about research. And uh, usually we never really figure out about what kind of places we are researching. We just assume that everything is like in large urban agglomerations. But Whoever has grown up in the village knows that this is not the case. Um, and that's uh, why it makes uh, this question so interesting. And um, just to, to find a connecting point to what is um, 
like the most uh, critical issue nowadays, um, the war in Ukraine and uh, the refugee uh, arrivals. Um, I, I added this picture, uh, which is, uh, you see from, from a UK a broadcasting uh, station, a photo of um, an arrival situation in Berlin. Um, just two days ago, as I saw a TV discussion with uh, the, the social deputy of Berlin, and she said during the last days, they had to provide emergency shelter for a thousand newly arrived refugees each day, which means that every day they have to find further 1,000 beds, mattresses, whatsoever, 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 volunteers, whatsoever. And um, so we, we are waiting the next step where the people are again further relocated and will then also arrive in the rural regions. So this is like a deja vu. Um, my research um, was done during the last year, starting from 2018. So we were basically, and I am basically today, reflecting on the long-term effects of the large-scale um, large arrivals of refugees in 2015-16 in Germany and um, how this uh, went in the rural regions, how integration um, went and uh, the question under which we started this research, research um, was um, if the relocation of refugees to rural regions is a sustainable strategy um, which serves both the integration of the people and the further rural development. And uh, this, this question uh, like developed in the context of a debate which we had in 2015 in September 2000, October 2015, when so many people arrived every day. And uh, like the situation in Berlin, like the, the, the main spots of arrival were overcrowded. And there was a huge discussion about how you could distribute people. And then this um, idea came up to, um, to, re to relocate people more into rural regions because the housing markets are less uh, dense than in the urban spaces. And um, so that was the point where this idea started to, to, to do research on that and uh, have a more holistic approach and really look into all aspects, not only the housing market, but all aspects of um, long-term inclusion, social inclusion of um, refugees. And um, I will um, have, I have some introductory slides just to introduce you to the um, German asylum system because I think we need that for understanding uh, what is going on. Uh, then I will um, explain our research methodology, which we did in, in this large project, which uh, we did not alone at the University of Chemnitz, but in a consortium of four partners. And then I have basically two perspectives. The first one is the perspectives of the refugees on their uh, arrival situation. And the second one is um, the perspective of the local population. And then I conclude. And uh, of course, I always, when I'm talking, have in mind that we now have a new refugee situation. And I'm very ready to, to, to start into a comparative discussion afterwards on what, what will this mean for like these experiences we, we collected? What does this mean for um, the new uh, arriving migrants, refugees from, from Ukraine. So as an introduction, um, you see here a long-term uh, perspective on um, asylum applications starting from uh, the uh, year of reunification in Germany, 1990. You see we were then around 200,000, then we had a quite a rise, uh, which was due to um, the wars in ex Yugoslavia. And, um, and then, like in, towards the, the change of the century, the asylum application numbers went down very much, which meant that all the reception infrastructures we had, um, like the buildings, but also the manpower, was reduced. Was reduced to save money, to, just to economize. And then, as you see, like starting from 2011, uh, the Arabic Spring, with increasing numbers, which were first uh, seen in Italy uh, from the European perspective, then slowly, slowly, slowly. And then since 
2014, quite quickly, quite rapidly, the numbers were growing. And you can see that we had a peak in 2016, a peak of asylum applications that were over 700,000. Most of those applications came from people who already arrived in 2015, which is also a sign for the overwhelming number of people, which really also overwhelmed the, the bureaucratic structures. So the, the authorities who are um, processing the asylum applications were not able to process all of those uh, applications of people who arrived in 2015. So that was really the peak moment, um, uh, like referencing back, um, we can say that in 2015 we had 890,000 um, arrivals of asylum seeking persons who then applied for asylum in 2015-16. And uh, the years after that, uh, we had some policy changes. Uh, the years after that, uh, the asylum numbers uh, were uh, going down again. But as we will learn soon, <laughs> um, we are still coping with uh, long-term effects of those arrivals here. The asylum procedure in Germany is a, a multi-step procedure. Um, we did a comparison uh, in, uh, actually with the uh, Dutch system. It's, it's about comparable, I would say. So it's like after arrival, you have to report to an authority that you're claiming asylum. Then you have to travel to a first reception facility um, where your asylum application is, is, is uh, started. And, uh, during the waiting time um, for the decision, you either have to stay in the first reception facility. This is a, pol a new policy which was introduced in 2016 and which is meant for the group of people who have bad chances for asylum. For example, people from the so-called safe states, safe, third state, or safe, uh, safe countries, um, and others like the Syrians, for example, could leave those first reception facilities and um, however, were usually then um, relocated to other group facilities um, and had to move again. So it's uh, like connected to several steps, several movements. And um, during the waiting time, um, you, you are eligible for um, social benefits for asylum seekers, which are organized differently in each, uh, in each uh, land, in each uh, um, state of the, of the federal um, states. And um, then after the decision, um, you, you get a, a status, which uh, if, if it's refugee status, it's a status for three years with which you can, um, you have access to all benefits like the, the, the ordinary citizens, like uh, labor market, uh, social benefits, and so on and so on. And uh, then you also have, there are also other kinds of decisions which are less good, like the subsidiary protection, which is only given for one year, or um, your application is denied. And often, for example, for the Afghan people, they, they cannot be sent back to their, to their country of origin. So they get what you call duldung toleration, which is a very weak status, which is also issued for very short um, time frames uh, in which it makes really difficult to integrate. Um, yeah, on the right side of the slide, you can see our redistribution scheme, the so-called Königsteiner Schlüssel, um, which is a burden sharing calculation. Um, uh, the idea is that uh, each land, each Bundesland, like of all of our lender, um, should take in um, the share of all arriving migrants, um, of all people who arrive in, in one year, um, in comparison to their population share and to their economic strength, which is measured by, by tax payments. And as you can see, the most populated uh, Bundesland, which is North Rhine-Westphalia, takes in 20%, uh, 21% of asylum-seeking people. This is about the population share, so the share of the total population. Where I am located, the Bundesland of Sachsen um, is taking in 5%, which means that people who, for example, arrive in the south of Bavaria, um, over the border to, from Austria, which was mostly the case for the 2015 migrants, usually went to Munich 
and then they were redistributed maybe to North Rhine-Westphalia and then from one first reception to a secondary reception where they waited for the asylum decision. And then we had an, another policy change in 2018, which um, meant that from this moment on, um, people who had um, who received a refugee status were still obliged to stay in the region where they were settled during the application procedure for three more years, which was an idea um, that the integration infrastructure, which was settled for those people, um, could still work effectively. And of course, there was the fear that people move on to usually the larger agglomerations where they maybe have um, peer groups or have relatives. Um, and uh, this would kind of hamper this idea of burden sharing. So that's basically the, 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 the policies. And I think it's not so different to the Dutch um, situation. And now uh, we slowly move into the situation of rural areas. Um, so basically you saw the Königsteiner Schlüssel idea. And basically if you go now down in our multi-level governance system to the, to the lender level, um, the idea is basically the same. So also on the state level, there is the burden sharing idea. So uh, which means that every county is taking a share of asylum seekers equivalent to their share of population. And then on the county level, there is again this idea of burden sharing, which means that all the municipalities which are part of the county have to offer uh, places to um, accommodate um, asylum seeking migrants. And um, that's why a significant share of asylum seeking migrants of all those large numbers who came in 2015 arrived in rural areas. And for many of those rural areas, it was the first time ever that they were confronted with receiving asylum seeking migrants. Because before the numbers were smaller and the people were not relocated in such many steps. Um, where are the rural regions in Germany? Um, if you look at the map, um, they are basically everywhere. <laughs> so there are, there are various definitions of rural areas. So it's in Germany is done by defining um, a low um, a population density. Um, actually, I don't have memorized the numbers, but it's a low population de density and uh, no large agglomerations nearby. So it's about this. And as you can see, the, the white spots on the map, that's the large agglomerations. So those are not rural regions and the other colors are rural regions of um, different um, levels. So, so very rural or rather rural, so there are still differences. But anyway, what you can see here on the map is, on the green colored map, uh, you can see the share of foreigners in rural counties. Um, and what I basically want to show with this map is, first of all, that um, in the rural counties, usually the share is not so large. So we have like in, in the whole of Germany, we have about uh, 10, 11% of foreigners, 25% of people with migration via biography. And in the rural regions, it's sometimes below 2%. So it's really, really small. However, if you look at the green colors, you can, you can figure out there are quite some varieties and uh, of course the largest difference is between the old west germany and the old east germany in the old east germany you can see that in the situation 2014 there was about less than two percent of people with foreign uh, origin in the rural regions um, and if you now look at the second map the blue colors this indicates the changes in the share of foreigners um, between 2014 and 2017. And now you can see that the colors are switching. So the dark colors are in the eastern parts, which means that there um, the, the increase of people with um, migration biography was much larger than in the western part. And in, in fact, if you, also, if you look at um, if, uh, population maps where the people come from, uh, you can see that um, in the eastern, in East German counties, usually now the Syrians, the Syrian people, are um, the most numerous 
group of foreigners. Before, it were Polish people. So before you had usually you um, migrants in the eastern parts, and now you have Syrians, um, Afghan people, and so on. So this really means a very big change for also the societies in those regions. While in the West, uh, in many of those areas which are quite close to um, the old industrial areas, um, you had significant numbers um, also of um, former labor migrants from, from Turkey, for example, um, or from, from Greece or from uh, uh, Tunisia and so on. And so there was quite um, diversity and uh, also the incoming asylum seeking migrants did not change the share of foreigners that much. So this is important to keep in mind because um, like we did a case study of a couple of cases and of course we, we tried to cover the variety of arrival situations, which also means the variety uh, of frameworks um, we have here. And um, I shortly introduce you into our methodology. Um, as I said, we did a huge research project and it was financed by um, um, a ministry, a federal ministry, which was the Ministry of Agriculture and uh, Rural Development, which is already indicating that uh, the main idea of this project and the main interest of the ministry was, in fact, to evaluate if the, the resettlement of asylum-seeking migrants could um, yeah, be of benefit for rural development uh, in those rural areas. And uh, for looking into all those situations, um, we um, basically relied on the model of integratory factors based on age and strength, um, which are basically those, those uh, yeah, uh, usual, I would say usual integration um, areas of employment, housing, education and health. Um, then they have this approach of uh, social, social networks, social bonds, social bridges, meaning um, social attachment to like in group and uh, between different groups. And then as facilitators for integration or inclusion, um, they uh, indicate a safety and security, uh, language and cultural knowledge and spatial mobility. That's what, what we added, the aspect of spatial mobility, very important in rural regions. And then as last and final point of the, the inclusionary process would be um, the citizenship and rights, citizen rights. Um, if we um, yeah, make a literature review on what we know about the specifics of rural settlements regarding immigration, regarding diversity development, um, we can summarize a couple of points. First of all, um, the rural settlement structure, which um, low, low population density, uh, therefore large distances to reach different places or different services, um, plus the scarcity of public transport, so that daily mobility, if you don't have you know, your own car, could become quite problematic, quite time consuming. We have specifics of a rural housing market. Um, it's true that it seems to be less dense than in the big agglomerations. Um, we have in many rural regions, we have uh, decades of um, demographic aging, old people dying out, houses being sold and so on. So there are vacancies. However, that, that's not vacancies on the rental housing market, um, which is a big difference. Uh, to like in Germany, uh, to the big agglomerations, because in Germany, the rental market is, has a significant share in, in housing. Um, and second point, which is quite important also for the group of asylum seeking migrants, um, uh, the, the public housing companies are usually only located in large agglomerations. So a small town usually would not have an own public housing stock, which they could use for social housing. And that's a big issue. Um, there is less access to migrant communities. If there are not so many migrants, if there's not so much diversity, you cannot relate to your own ethical, ethnical community, be it for buying uh, original foods uh, or spices, meeting people, talking your own language, uh, going to religious services or so on. So this is not the case. Um, there are limited administrative resources. 
Um, often those small towns are organized uh, under a county administration. So if you are arriving as an asylum seeking migrant and you have issues um, with the foreign uh, authority, for example, this is usually not at that place where you live, but you have to travel to the, the, the county capital. And also in those places, there are usually less people who are specialized with um, immigration and integration issues. For example, specialized labor market uh, consultants who can really consult you like what uh, you have to do until you can enter the labor market if you are an immigrant. Uh, the last aspect is social nearness. Here, um, we assumed from our reading that um, small towns, like population of small towns, often um, have a quite uh, dense uh, social fabric. Um, often, they, they are very much self-organized, uh, meaning they have a lot of civil society engagement, a lot of associations where people meet and where they um, build up networks. And I think the most um, telling example is um, the, 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 the fire, fire brigade, is it? Yeah, fire brigade, which is um, a voluntary um, association usually in the rural regions. So you have no professionals. When your house is burning, um, you, you, you are calling uh, the volunteers who are hopefully uh, extinguish your fire. Um, so that means that they are really relying on those social networks and of course, those networks could also be helpful uh, for integration aspects. Of course, only if the newcomers are also included in those networks. So that's what we also wanted to find out. Yeah, but there's few expertise regarding diversity management. So, yeah, social nearness, yes, but also social control, maybe less flexibility with uh, diversity issues and that's the situation. So um, our project, as I said, was financed by uh, the Federal Ministry for um, uh, Nutrition and Agriculture. <laughs> I always forget this name. <clears throat> um, we were a consortium of four different institutions, like the TU Chemnitz and then University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, the University of Hildesheim and the Thunen Institute, which is a federal research institute uh, specialized on rural regions and agriculture. We did our research, as you can see on the map, all those little green spots in four states, four länder. It was Niedersachsen, Hessen, Bavaria and Sachsen. And in each of those länder, we chose um, two counties. So we had eight counties altogether. And in those counties, uh, we chose um, in each county eight municipalities um, of different size, like very small until maybe 20,000 or so inhabitants. Um, to do our research. We did a lot, <laughs> like we did a structural analysis of, of structural data, like mobility data, for example. We did um, participatory interviews with refugees. We collected 137. We did interviews with experts from local politics, county administration, social workers, and so on. We did interviews with civil society stakeholders, and we did a representative survey um, among the rural population, um, which had a number of items which are usually asked in those big surveys, which collect the attitudes of the population. So also um, attitudes about immigration, for example. And then we did a local media analysis. So we, get, we, we collected, I think, 1,200 local media articles and did uh, media analysis. Okay, so um, I will go into my empirical part and start with uh, the perspective of our um, uh, refugee um, interviewees. And um, first of all, um, I want to show you on this photo, which is on this slide, um, uh, the participatory aspect of our, of our research. Um, of course, we had, we had to bridge uh, language difficulties and also difficulties to, to, to engage into this topic. Um, and so we had a couple of tools where uh, our migrant interviewees could, uh, could draw or could show something on the map or reorganize um, together with our interviewees on the map. And what you can see here on this photo is a mobility timeline, um, which is um, helping the migrants 
to um, to realize the steps of their migratory trajectory and how many times they moved in Germany um, until they arrived there. And in fact, many of our interviewers really had difficulties to remember their movements and where they entered the country, where they were sent and so on. And uh, there's also one, one quote of an, of an interview I reached out to you, which, which shows this, uh, this uh, confusion. Um, in Munich, um, this interview says, we went to the police. The police took our fingerprints. We stayed there overnight. Then a bus came and brought us somewhere. And then again, I don't know where it was. Then we lived near the border to Switzerland for one month. We lived in a refugee home, but I forgot the name of the village. We lived in four or five refugee homes, new refugee homes, new buses, new people, until we came here. So you, you can already read, like, read from this citation that it's really a, a big confusion for many of those people because they did not really understand uh, all those different steps in the reception process and what, that, what this meant. And um, in fact, you never know when it's worth getting, like, yeah, settling down, yeah? to make your place. Um, so those frequent relocations were uh, a common uh, narration. And um, also many of our interviewees um, said that they had relatives in Germany, relatives, friends, but often they were really family members who lived in other parts and they were not allowed to reunite with them. And there were really confusing uh, experiences. For example, one young, young man said, uh, like people with whom he travels on the Balkan route were sent to a place where his uncle lives. But he was not sent there, but to a place 700 kilometers away. So really confusing. And from your individual perspective as an asylum seeking migrant, it makes no sense. It has no logic. Um, so they are really striving for reuniting with relatives. Um, but as I said, they have those residence restrictions. So it's quite difficult for them to uh, make their um, decisions. Um, so uh, to, to sum up some of difficulties, some of the difficulties our interviews found in rural localities. Um, and of course, they did not only find uh, difficulties. Many of our interviews also um, really had a sense of safety and security um, in those small towns, uh, notably families with small, uh, small children, um, they're really feeling very well, also well integrated in the rural societies with the children in school, with a lot of, of um, neighbors or of volunteers who were really helping them a lot. Um, but on the other hand, there, there were also a lot of problems um, for migrants in those rural localities. For example, to find appropriate housing. Um, as I said, there is not so much public housing. Um, especially the Syrian families usually are larger than the ordinary German families, so they need a larger apartment, which is hard to find. Um, often there is not, not a rental housing market at all, so they really have not so much offers. Um, then they are sometimes discriminated on the housing market, so that people uh, don't want to, to rent their, their house or their apartment um, to foreigners. So these were difficulties and uh, this also means that um, not only in rural regions, but also in the urban regions, quite a share of people who came between 215 and 270 is still living in group accommodations today. And um, if you just now consider the arrival of Ukrainian refugees, this could become a problem very soon. To find appropriate work, the second point, what kind of work can you find in rural regions? Um, you can work um, in, in the, the crafts work. Um, there are small craft companies who are really also looking for, for workers. Um, there are also some, some industries where you could work. Um, there are also some services, um, especially health, health services like old people's homes or uh, some, some, some hospitals and so on. Um, however, um, our interviewers really found it difficult to find appropriate work, um, often um, because they had first they had to, to approach um, the, the qualification they needed. For example, 
a Syrian male migrant who worked as a, um, uh, a hair, hair cutter, hairdresser, thanks, hairdresser, who worked as a hairdresser for 20 years and has like practical knowledge, but he doesn't have the certificate which is relevant for the German labor market. So it will be difficult for this person to get a job as a hairdresser. The same for people who are working as, as yeah, mechanics or whatever. Yeah, question. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> uh, regardless of, of these restrictions and yeah. uh, diploma or certificate mm -hmm. evaluation, are they immediately allowed to work? Uh, or should they also uh, first do their language courses? Because I think mm -hmm. this is mostly the problem in the Netherlands. Well, uh, yeah, this is, this is a general uh, uh, question, of course, and a general problem. Um, it, it differs. Um, it differs from the status, like asylum-seeking people from so-called, like from from countries where they usually get um, a refugee status, um, get very early um, their uh, labor market uh, entry allowance. Um, others have to wait longer. Um, and they, then they are also eligible to enter a language class. And in fact, without learning German, there is no entry into the labor market. Mm -hmm. So this is really scarce. I mean, maybe some IT jobs where you speak English, um, but this is not in the rural regions. So this is really, this is an issue. So you need, you need German, you need to know very good German, spoken German, um, and then you need, um, the qualification, not only the practical, but also the certificate. Um, and then you need to convince a small company, which maybe never employed foreigners, which only has German employees and German customers to engage you, to employ you. And these are really barriers. And of course, there is not so, such a large variety of job offers uh, as in, in large agglomerations. But on the other hand, we really have to say that in all those regions where we did research, um, the stakeholders we talked to all said that the labor markets are really, really absorptive. Their, labor, their people are really looking for, for empl employees. Uh, so theoretically, uh, this could match, but in, in practical terms, uh, it often doesn't so well. Um, another problem we um, heard from our interviews was to establish social contacts to the locals. Um, when we asked why, <laughs> it was often a very easy aspect, uh, the demographic difference. Uh, like most of the refugees who came in 2015 were very young. Like, yeah, youngsters, teenagers, young families, young adults. And many of those interviews said, well, when I go out of my house, I only see old people. So this is really an effect of demographic aging in rural regions that you, of course, you have an older uh, population and it's, you first have to find um, people of your age group to talk to. And of course, if you have, have, um, have uh, are a, a family with children, uh, you get your contacts over the school. Um, but in other cases, it's more difficult. And also, there were quite some narrations that people, even though there, there are those 10 social networks, I was talking in my assumption uh, part, they exist but they are not naturally open to everybody. So often it's a very static situation, static social situation. And um, our migrant interviews sometimes found it very hard to, to get into those circles, those closed circles. Um, to find other migrants for networking. So especially if social context to the locals is so difficult, you want to to have some easy context, maybe to people whom you don't have to explain everything, like your habits, your culture, what you, what you like to eat, what you like to drink, your language, whatever, your experiences, your migration experiences. You just want to meet with peer people, with peers, and um, often they cannot be found in those rural regions a lot. 
So the networking and the also the, the collective empower, empowerment of those groups is often not possible. And then, of course, mobility. Mobility is really a problem, notably if you are dependent on public transport. And um, asylum-seeking migrants um, usually have no driver's license, which was um, uh, yeah, which was uh, uh, valid in Germany, um, and they had no money to, to buy a car. Uh, so they they were really relying on public transport. And this means that in some villages, you have during school times you have three buses a day. In the school holidays, you have no bus. That's it. Um, and so look into those quotes. Um, one of our interviewees says, we often go to the next town where there are some authorities where they have to, uh, um, to meet some appointments. That costs 10 euro for each way. So I pay 20 euro for an appointment of 15 minutes. For example, to go to the foreigners authority for doing some bureaucratic issues. Um, the other one says, uh, I don't like the trip to the education center in the next bigger town. It takes 2.5 hours, two and a half hours, and I have to change three times. So if you, for example, if you have, if you need to take a special language class for preparing for your um, uh, um, um, labor market segment, maybe you need some special language training for, for your uh, qualification. This is not offered in small towns. This is only offered in the large agglomeration. So if you want to attend this, you have to travel quite a while. And then the third quotation, which is talking about, or who's talking about health issues, and it also reflects this difficulty to get into social contacts with locals, but also to, to the peers. Um, a woman um, uh, speaking Arabic, so we had an interpreter in this interview, she said, after we moved to this small town, I was sick. And it became worse when we were here. I was suicidal. I went to a psychiatrist. I was so much under pressure and often went to hospital because I had no contacts here. I just met no one. So there are really people who feel totally alone. And um, another point, um, which we mostly, I must say, collected from the civil society interview is because the refugees did not really want to talk about it, was um, othering discrimination and racism. And when that, those who talked about it really told um, shocking stories. Um, so in the, in the first uh, quotation, that's an interview from a civil society organization um, who has number of contacts to refugees and really has also an overview of what they are experiencing. And uh, often they are experiencing discrimination and, and racist um, and verbal attacks in public transport because that's the place where they meet the locals and where they cannot like avoid meeting them. And uh, I read it out to you and I think it's really a stunning example. One of the refugees, an Eritrean, went to a city by bus. During the trip, an old woman entered the bus and he stood up to offer her his seat. The woman said to him, you don't have to leave the seat for me, but you should leave my country. And so this, this kind of atmosphere um, is, is really often reflected by more by our civil society interviewees who are doing volunteering or whatsoever, social work, um, rather not by our uh, refugee interviewees, but we have, like I have one example I brought um, with me, a, a woman who tells about um, a physical assault. Um, she says, I went to get some food from the Arabic store nearby. When I walked there, a Nazi came on a bike um, and he hit me with a rod and he also wanted to beat the children. Then I fainted. I did not tell anyone and I did not report to the police because I did not want to cause any problems. So that's the perspective that if you tell the police, it's rather not that uh, the person who assaulted you um, gets problems, but you might get problems. So there is uh, also not a very like uh, good feeling to, to, to get safety by the police authorities. Um, yeah, so that's what people are facing. Um, and um, we also uh, looked at it, and I will come to 
this further point in 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, we also looked at this aspect uh, when we when we researched um, the perspective of the local population. And uh, I also I found it really stunning when we when I did the, the media, the media analysis, uh, how much othering discourse was in the media articles how much culturalizations, exotizations of those people who are coming. And uh, yeah, it, it was like really, yeah, you, you really could feel from this media analysis that um, there is very few experience with uh, lived diversity and uh, very little self-reflection about your own racist attitudes. Um, just a consequence of that may be um, the retention quota. So, as I told you, this, is, this was the idea of burden sharing. The people are sent everywhere in Germany, also to the rural regions. They are made to stay there for longer. Uh, however, this policy was only introduced in 2018. So, some of the people who arrived in 2015 um, could indeed move on as soon as, well as they were not anymore dependent on a social uh, transfer payment. And um, so indeed, if you look at the retention rate, um, you see quite a difference. Um, what you see here, those shares, that's the share of refugees who arrived between uh, January 2012 and March 2021 who are still living in the county where they have been relocated originally. So it's on county level. And uh, these are all our counties. We did research and you can see at the, the highest retention rate is uh, in Lower Saxony with uh, uh, about, uh, like between 70 and 78. Um, the lowest retention rate is in Saxony uh, with the very lowest retention in um, in Bautzen, Landkreis Bautzen, County of Bautzen, with um, forty-seven percent um, about, um, which means that obviously um, the, the the push factors to move on were felt stronger in some areas of the country as in others. But this was just being recent arrivals, Syrians probably because. Before 2016, there were very few foreigners than the yeah. other refugees living in the Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. So they left yeah. already uh, half left. Yeah. Do we know where they went to? From, from, from Not the from the statistics. I mean, this is this is the uh, the the foreign central register, which is also a quite um, um, yeah the beamer went off. Our our digital community does not realize it at all, so we have to restart the beamer. Um, maybe it went too hot, but I can I can I can explain a little bit about this. So it's it's um, the the central foreigner registration. Um, and uh, you, you cannot connect all data with everything. So we don't know where the people went, um, but we can see like who is still living uh, in this county. Of course, you cannot really say, you, you cannot make a causality of that because of course you, you have different groups um, who were uh, very, very young, thanks. <laughs> so the beamer is on again. Um, you have different groups um, who were sent to the different counties. So, for example, the share of Syrians or the share of, of uh, Kosovars and so on is not the same in every county. And of course, those groups have also different chances to get a refugee status. And maybe some are made to return more than others. So it's not one-to-one -one comparable, but it's nearing. So you can really use it for figuring out that, that, that this could be an effect, at least partly, of different receptivity in those areas of the country. That's what you can really say. And also, if you look at the um, kind of um, status people have who are still there, like those who are here, uh, like the green colored, um, you can also see what kind of status they have. And in those counties with a very low retention rate, 
uh, is the highest share of people with a very weak status, like the toleration, Duldung, for example, which means those people cannot move on, which again means all those who could, like I'm exaggerating a little bit, like, but many who could, did move on. Yeah. Okay, so let's come to the next um, topic, to the next um, piece of, of empirical data, which is um, looking into um, the attitudes of the local population. How receptive are they? What, they, what did they expect? Um, were they open to those new neighbors? Uh, were they engaging? Um, and what, what do they think uh, how people can um, integrate into their um, society and into the community? And um, as I said, among other measures, we also did um, a written survey where we collected um, so many um, data, like 904 uh, people responded to this survey so that we could uh, do quite some um, varied analysis. And uh, I have here first a question, like we had a couple of questions about um, the social quality, like people perceive um, the quality of living together in those small towns. Our assumption is that there is quite a social density, so people rely on each other. And that's why we asked uh, about the neighborhood. And we asked, what do you wish if new people move into your neighborhood? And I think the first aspect is to look at this uh, little uh, uh, window here um, and to look um, how um, static or fluid the neighborhood is. And you can see it's not very fluid. Um, like 44% of our interviewees said they were born there. 31% 30, said they lived there more than 20 years. Um, and 75% of the interviewees uh, owned their, their house owners. So there is a lot of that like, very static situation. If you compare that to, to Amsterdam, for example, um, like, like, like how, how large would be the share of people who are living here since ever or since more than 20 years? So it's, that's really different. So there is not so much fluctuation. Um, so, you, so you also can assume that they are really static neighborhoods. But anyway, if people move in, if new people are coming, what are they expecting? And you can see what they're expecting. They are expecting that the new neighbors greet in the street. Yeah, so that's the usual habit in, in small towns, probably in the Netherlands also, that you say um, if you are uh, meeting people in the street. That they are open towards joint activities in the neighborhood. Um, that they respect the rules. Still half of uh, the interviewees say that. That they introduce themselves to me so that they make some efforts to, to, to get to uh, know each other. And then there is one third who says, uh, well, I would wish that they don't disturb me. Um, and 20% says, um, I would wish that everything stays as it is, which means as it has been since 100 years, since I'm living here, because I'm an old person. So yeah, I'm again exaggerating a little bit, but um, that's, that's, that gives an impression that um, this is quite a static neighborhood. And if you move in, um, even if you are only um, um, of different age structures, like um, it's an aging neighborhood, like elderly people, and then um, a family with small children moves in, children who are playing and who are noisy and, and so on, um, you can assume that this makes uh, some problems. And it might be the case that those problems are not referenced to your family status, but to your ethnicity, if there are conflicts. Um, in our qualitative data, we found other aspects about the neighborhood quality. And we saw that um, this is a very um, uh, useful, functional um, uh, uh, neighborhood quality. So one interview says neighbors don't necessarily have to be friends, but it's important to have good neighbors that makes daily living much easier or life as such. Um, so they are really relying on this functionality. They help each other, uh, but that does not really mean that, that you get this yeah, social inclusion and have this feeling of being welcome and so on. Not necessarily. 
Um, like as greeting in the street is so um, yeah, important for those neighbors, um, it can also be an instrument of, um, of signifying that newcomers are part of the community. This was explained by an interviewee who is working um, as a volunteer and has a lot of contact to refugees. And he just explained that um, in the small town where he lives, um, they, had, they had the welcome meetings where the volunteers and the mayor and so on met the new uh, refugees and learned their names. And then they, it was just the habit to greet them with their name when they met them in the supermarket on the street. And what, is, what he tells here, uh, that he realizes that this really took off the tension because local and refugees meet each other. And when you greet each other loudly in the supermarket with a name, then everybody takes notice. And also those people who did not yet meet the refugee sees, okay, the mayor knows this person already and greets him with a name. So this must be a person who belongs to us now. So this is like a, an, it's a signifier, a ritual, uh, which could uh, demarcate belonging and which could be uh, quite effective in um, those um, small localities. Um, on, on the downside, um, if we talk about the social density of small localities, that there is a high, uh, often there is a high normativity of, of how daily life has, has to be, like how people have to behave, like young people have to look like and have to behave and so on. And um, so we had a little situation where there was um, some, were, were some volunteers who visited uh, the, new, the newly um, moved in um, refugee families and realized um, that they had this, um, those uh, apartments which were given to them by the foreigners authorities, which were very basically equipped. And it was so basically equipped that they had no curtains. And as they want, did not want to show everything, uh, they started um, putting newspaper on, on the windows, just putting it on the windows so that people could not look into the windows. So, so. So you don't do this in the Netherlands, but in Germany, everybody has curtains so that you cannot look into the, so that you could, cannot look into the house. Uh, so okay, so that, so that's what the refugees did, just as like a first aid measure. And then those volunteers came and realized that this does not look so neatly as the other houses. And as this is a spa town, they were concerned that the tourists who come. Don't, don't like this. And that's why they went to those families and said, um, we don't put newspaper on the window screen because we are a spa town and the tourists need not to notice that refugees are living here, just normal people from other countries. And we have curtains at the windows. And then they just like made, made a collection, uh, collected curtains and collected machine, a uh, drilling machine, and then they went from apartment to apartment and put up the curtains so that the social norms were stable again. Yeah. And uh, interesting is really to, 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 to go into those fine grains of the citation, of this quotation. I mean, of course, I, I translated it from German. I did my very best, but maybe it does not come out 100%. But it, they really said, just normal people from other countries. So this, this transports that refugees are somehow not normal and somehow not, um, yeah, not, not uh, from, the, from the hierarchical status of populations, they, they might be somewhere at the bottom, which um, would not be so advisable to show if you are a tourist place. So that's what you can get from this quotation. And by the way, quite telling is what I, um, what I reflect, what I heard from um, some media coverage of the Ukrainian refugees who arrived in uh, Germany. And there was one uh, person who said, well, we are not refugees, we are travelers. We are traveling. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to, to be yeah, stigmatized with that label. Yeah. Um, yeah, we are again uh, trying to find out the specifics of those local places and uh, I, I showed you the maps where, you, where we had this very small share 
of foreigners. So you can assume that um, those localities have zero experience with diversity. But this is not the case. In fact, when we talked, especially with the mayors, about how they reflected the arrival of um, asylum-seeking migrants and their integration efforts and so on, they were often really like going very much back in time, like after the Second World War, when the German refugees came. And then uh, it turned out that practically 100% of the localities we, we did research in had a local migration biography. They all had experiences integrating people who came and who did not move there voluntarily for the first case, like the refugees, or who were international immigrants and thus had to yeah, be included into the society. They had those experiences. And um, what they, um, like just two examples, how they reflected um, the period of labor migration. Um, and I, I brought um, one example for East Germany, typical example, and one typical example for West Germany. East Germany, they had very large population of Vietnamese uh, labor migrants, um, also from other countries, but Vietnamese labor migrants were in the end of the 1980s, the, the most numerous. And uh, you can see a photo here um, of, of a factory where Viet Vietnamese women are um, working. And uh, quotation, we had Vietnamese people, they were hard working, they worked in the former machine factory, and they did not stand out, they only were busy working. So that's like when we, when we made them reflect how they um, perceived those, those migrants, um, we heard um, like um, focusing on, 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 on being busy, on, on working, and not standing out, like being somehow among each other. And in fact, in East Germany, um, the labor migrants are very much organized in groups and it was the official state policy that um, the groups should not mix. So there should not be contact between the local Germans and uh, the, the, the foreigners. It was not really wanted. And, and that's a reflection. There were somewhere in their workers' homes, then they were in the factory, they did their work, they were busy and they caused no problems. Um, the other example is from the West German case where um, also in the rural regions there were those industrial um, companies who uh, engaged labor migrants in the 1970s from Turkey, from Italy, from Portugal, um, from Tunisia, uh, from Yugoslavia and so on. And also here the reflection is very much the working. This, the, this woman says this was different with the guest workers because they came to work here. They worked here and they were very busy here and that's um, why integration was easier. So that was the reflection. Um, that's because they did not come for humanitarian reasons and were kind of lost, like the asylum seekers in the beginning, but they came on purpose and came with a very yeah, specific and um, defined purpose. It was easier for integration. Um, I'm not a specialist in the historical migration uh, research, but I would really like to look uh, deeper into this um, uh, narration because uh, I think if you talk with like old Italian labor migrants or Turkish labor migrants, they might remember it differently. Yeah. yeah. Quite likely. Yeah, but like that's the perception of the locals. And from this perception, so that, that's, that's the reference frame their perception, if it's true or not, but it's their reference frame from which they look at humanitarian migrants. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, makes a difference if those are um, uh, perceived as not working. Of course, we know many of them cannot work or are not allowed to work or need a long time and so on and so on. But um, in the perception, um, they make those differences. The one are very busy, they are working, they are not causing problems, they are not causing costs. And the others are not busy, are yeah, causing costs and problems and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, this kind of um, uh, reflection. And I come to uh, my next um, topic, which, um, which is the perception of integration. 
And I put this in quotation marks because if we, if we reflect on it um, academically, of course, uh, we don't like this uh, um, notion of integration very much. But in, in, the, in the political practice, it's integration all over. <laughs> so all those integration specialists, and so they're always talking about integration. And so that's why we decided to use this term in our research and not use inclusion or diversity or so on. And that's why we asked um, our interviewers, our stakeholders, um, about their perceptions of integration. And often they not only told us their own perception, but also what they thought about the local population. So the perceptions of the local population. And that's, for example, in this quotation, I read it out. Um, well, I think our society mostly expects that you integrate, that's what they say, what they mean, assimilation. They don't want to be disturbed. And you remember this uh, data I showed you, right? They don't want to be disturbed, even in the public, by women with their long flowing clothes, by young men who look like strangers with their black birds, black hair, and then with their mobiles and cigarettes, or they walk around and gather in public places. So she is really talking about it quite ironically because she is reflecting on what the local population always uh, 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 yeah, claims uh, what is disturbing, uh, that, that you have to be frightened uh, at night because all those people are now there and so on. And, and this is with a very culturalistic uh, perspective. And um, yeah, so we, 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 we organized um, several, several um, frames of integration, what we found, and most of those frames um, uh, reflecting the framing of the local population were in fact assimilative frames of, of integration or of um, social inclusion. Um, yeah, and then another very interesting aspect, I think, um, uh, many of our stakeholders indeed reflected what generally happens if newcomers come to the small town. Uh, not, not even immigrants, but anybody who comes, maybe who moves from a larger city to build a house there. And um, this like leads into this citation, the second citation. Um, the person says, but here it doesn't matter if I am a refugee or a native, I have to integrate. I have to be willing to engage here and the local people have to be willing to engage with me. That's how it works here. And also on this citation, it's worthy to reflect a little bit uh, because first of all, you have this um, idea that integration is a two-sided process. So it's not only you who has to, to, to make effort, effort to integrate, but also the other side, the group where you want to be a member of, um, has to make an effort or at least at least open up to you and, and let you in. Um, yeah, and then I think this part that it doesn't matter if you are a refugee or a native, I think it's not meant that it does not matter at all because of course those, those group, group differences are strong in the, in the public perception. But what she means here is that even native people who move from another place to the small town have these problems that they are perceived as strangers and have to struggle to get into those social circles. Yeah. And then uh, I think that's the last piece of my empirical um, uh, data I brought, um, a piece from uh, our media survey, media um, analysis, um, which is um, and a piece where a person was interviewed um, who was taking care of her two young unaccompanied um, um, Afghan migrants um, who have a refugee status and uh, who are now 18, 19, 20 years old and who are looking for um, a place for, um, for training, for traineeship, training on the job. And they are not finding anything. And this um, person who is taking care of those two people um, um, has them as, as volunteers at, as, uh, at a place where you have like a, like a youth hostel, where like a, a school classes are housed and so on. And uh, this person, this interviewer is always um, telling that uh, those two young male refugees, um, very handsome, very helpful, and um, that they are even 
though they are so handsome that they can do so much, they are so motivated, they speak German and so on and so on, they, they cannot find a job or a traineeship. Um, and the article says, they have written more than 20 job applications to local companies, but they have not been invited once. Also direct contacts with local firms were not successful. Um, and then quotation from this newspaper article, when the boys helped on the building site of the new, new youth hostel, uh, the person in the interview remembers, the company bosses were amazed how much and how effectively they engaged. But when those two Afghans addressed the bosses regarding the opportunity for an internship or a treaty position, they refused immediately. The reason, when I employ foreigners, my customers won't give me assignments anymore. Um, and that's not a single example, but I have it several spots also in my in my big media data and also in several places of our case studies. So this perception and anticipation that the society is racist prevents employers to employ those refugees. Okay, I, I think this is just some 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 insights, some parts of some partial insights into this uh, this perspective of the local populations, and um, I will try to wrap this up. Um, and uh, I have three points in my wrap up. First, uh, the the topic of um, inclusion in local neighborhoods, as we uh, assume the, the this social nearness is really a winning point in, in rural regions, and this could be helpful for uh, social inclusion of, um, of refugees who are resettled there. And indeed, we see that those local social circles, not only neighborhoods, but also other kinds of uh, social um, uh, circles, have numerous potentials um, to support social inclusion but they are not automatically accessible for refugees, for example. Um, social inclusion in neighborhoods is based on functional reciprocity, so it's like uh, giving and taking. Um, and if, if you have a potentially diverging or disturbing behavior, um, you can be refused and sanctioned in the neighborhood. And this means like, having children while all, all others are elderly people or cooking at times where other people are not cooking or having guests when others are not having guests and so on. Um, inclusion in local institutions. Also again, here we have this assumption that local institution, for example, those um, volunteer associations are important for the, like, for the social kids, the social glue um, of those rural societies. Um, they are, but also they are not automatically open to everybody and they often have to Im have implicit expectations that migrants assimilate so that they don't have to change at all um, and that social inclusion works via the adoption of social norms so it's a very assimilationalist approach um, and then what you also found and what is also an aspect um, we also recommended to work further on that um, uh, in, in the local administration units and so on, that institutional activities are mostly focusing on the problems that immigration makes and not on the potentials this could bring. So though this idea of rural development, which was like in our, in our work contract, was not reflected by most of our interviewees at all. So that this could be a potential at all. Um, yeah, how can you, how can you explain this from a social theory, social theoretical perspective. Uh, and we again and again came back um, to, to social capital and social identities. And we found this, this notion of social identity and how social identities are constructed. Um, they are constructed also by, um, uh, ex by, by excluding others. So by defining one's own position via excluding other positions, so that this has a really strong impact in those small towns, which are so static uh, with their uh, population and their demographic structures. So that there are really strong borders between the own and the other. And um, that the social order, but also the spatial order um, in those small towns are very, very persistent and very powerful for every 
step you do as a newcomer, as a refugee um, towards social inclusion. And that's where I stop. Um, just giving you um, for further reading um, two articles we wrote about. And then again, of course, our book we produced a couple of years ago uh, with a collection of uh, of pieces also on rural regions. So thanks very much for your attention and um, Thank you, we can yeah. now discuss. Let's see whether there are any, let's first try the people back home. Yes, how, how will we do this? Will, will I read the, 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 the chat? No, yes. I think people can simply raise that. Or, or they can uh, unmute themselves. Yes, and, uh, that's probably yeah. the best if you mm -hmm. um, unmute yourself. Um, to engage in the discussion. And I, I close this here so that we can see each other. All right. Maybe then I can ask you what what were your recommendations to the Minister of Agriculture and, and the Ministry and Development? Uh, uh, because that, that, that how and what, having a policy background of some kind uh, i'm always okay so yeah what can you do what what can you do um um i mean in fact i hope uh, that they will reflect a little more now when when the ukrainians have to be resettled uh that you cannot only look at one aspect like this true argument that housing markets might not be that problematic in rural regions compared to urban regions this one and single argument is just not enough to make those decisions. Uh, so what we recommend is really to look into the, um, I would say the talent of a locality. And we also have some, uh, some um, uh, novel projects now, um, quite experimental, which try before a locality, a municipality is taking in refugees, uh, to make the municipality write an integration concept and just check what capacities they have, not only housing, but everything which is necessary, like childcare, social counseling, healthcare, um, volunteering, and so on. Um, also look into the willingness of the society, uh, into also the willingness of authorities to reflect their own behavior. For example, that they actually do need some diversity education, that they are not naturally non-racist. Um, so we have some experiments now going on like this, uh, which which could be quite quite uh, profitable if 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 this can work out. That you then match the populations, that you also ask refugees if they can imagine to live in a rural region, if they have an idea how this could be, um, and look at, at their needs. And then maybe you can, you can really bring them together in a better way and really also explain uh, what refugees have to expect explain the local population what they have to expect um, and really do some investment into diversity um, management, diversity education um, and really um, follow up continu uh, in con continuously. Not only like when you have this mass influx, um, then you have a lot of programs for integration managers and so on. And after two years, the programs are ending, the managers are put off the job and nobody really has this, like collects this experience or, or saves this experience to really uh, try to develop this uh, as a long term and really have um, like develop good networks between the different branches like education, labor market, language classes and so on. Really build good networks so that really those stakeholders know of each other and um, share good practice examples. Like, um, for example, in many, many interviews um, and also in the, in the media analysis, uh, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of narration that, like from employers, for example, that it must be so difficult to integrate refugees into the labor market. And when you asked back if, if they have some practical ideas, some practical examples, usually they don't have. 
And uh, so why don't you share those best practice examples wider um, and really offer also as a, as a, as a union, for example, the trade union or, um, or, or chamber of, of craft chamber or so, really share those best practice and share um, experiences of companies, for example, who hired migrants, who hired refugee migrants with the specific status and maybe also specific needs and just try to, 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 to share those experiences and to show people that there are ways. We have a question. Yes, we have a question. Ricardo Martins. Ricardo, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Congratulations, Big uh, Birgit. Can you make this a little bit louder? Yes, we have to make it a little bit louder. And uh, uh, <clears throat> one, one, one second, it's done, it's done here. It's our loudspeaker who has to... Maybe. Who has to... Uh, oh, no. Maybe it's yours. You can also turn yeah. it. Uh, maybe I'm going to right. use... Maybe I'm going ah. to use... Uh, no, it's good. No, it's good. Good? Yes. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> good. Uh, so it reminds me a lot, your conference about the Norbert Elias uh, book, uh, The Established and yeah. the Outsiders. Absolutely. Yeah. That could be a good framework of analysis. Absolutely. Uh, he conducted that in England. Uh, yeah. In the beginning of the 20th century. I didn't know that. Absolutely. Years. Actually, we did some rereading of that. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, you, uh, the overall uh, evaluation gave me a negative tone, in fact. Uh, but so, uh, going back to the, to the point that you were mentioning at the end, but what's the, the role or the impact of migrants, refugees, for the rural development? Mm -hmm. Do they have uh, an impact, a good role on that? Can, could you see something? Okay. Yes, I, I mean, maybe, maybe we are um, researchers are sometimes a little bit like journalists, um, focusing too much on the negative news. <laughs> That's what I maybe also did today. Of course, there are also a lot of a lot of positive um, effects, but not in all of our case studies. And um, there, there were cases, there were local cases where um, uh, social inclusion seemed to work quite well. So like people on both, like from both perspectives, I opened up here, were quite satisfied with the development. And those were usually localities where you already had a, 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 some share of, some, some share of um, foreigners. So some um, idea of diversity um, where you already had um, diversity also in the labor market. Um, where you had um, a strong needs of the labor market and where the labor market stakeholders were just naturally also um, getting uh, to, the, to the refugees and making them offers just as they would with any other newcomer or any other immigrant. While in other regions, the, the refugees were really perceived aside labor migrants, as if they were not able or willing to, to get into the labor market. And so we, we really could connect this to, um, to diversity, to the naturality, how you perceive diversity. Um, and uh, maybe uh, one more argument uh, for that, because I also did not touch on that um, during the lecture, um, there is a, a very was a very strong uh, anti-Muslim sentiment in in all our data, and in those localities where we had a good practice, we usually had um, we, there, there was already Muslim population. For example, by the Turkish labor migrants uh, who came like in the 1960s, 70s. And uh, there was also a mosque, and there was a mosque association um, who also engaged in the reception of refugees and so on. So it was more natural to, to have Muslim women, for example, with a headscarf, while this headscarf issue was a very big issue in other regions. The region you mean mostly East, uh, the former East Germany? 
which is more problematic? Uh, well, I mean, in fact, we only had two regions in East Germany in our case study sample. So I, I really don't want to generalize. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, those two regions we had in East Germany were among those regions um, where the arrival, the, the reception of asylum-seeking migrants was not perceived as being beneficial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was really a lot uh, connected to, to the issue of labor market development. Mm -hmm. Not so much, um, we were surprised that it was not so much uh, connected to demographic refreshment, like making the region or making the municipality younger, but there were also younger people, children and so on. That was not so much the, the, the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for the interesting question, Ricardo. Actually, we work on the same project. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was also a lot about um, well, initiatives for and by migrants yeah. um, in uh, rural franking areas. So actually about those um, things that you mentioned, you know, what makes the difference, uh, what makes a place maybe more welcoming than other places. So um, it was really interesting to hear findings and many of the things resonated with uh, what I'm seeing in, in the Netherlands and also hearing from colleagues in other countries. Um, you just mentioned that the labor market situation influenced the perception. Do you think that uh, perception of the like, beneficiality of uh, migration, can you actually see um, like differences um, if you look at, for example, um, unemployment rates and kind of like this idea of um, uh, feeling threatened by migrants over, for example, employment. Ah, you mean that the locals, yeah, because oh, okay. really higher, like, like, like this idea of social envy or relative deprivation and so on. Well, in fact, um, the labor market all over Germany, like in every region, um, is really like was turning during the last 20 years um, into a labor market which is urgently looking for for employees yeah. so we have in all those regions we really have a low share low unemployment unemployment share um, and uh, in fact also in those regions which are not like showing so much openness to to refugees also regarding labor market access at the same time they are hiring like they are hiring like eu migrants for example there are, there are companies who are going to Bulgaria and are trying to hire, to hire nurses and like get them into those places and have them work in the, in the hospital or in, in, the, in the old people's homes. Mm -hmm. So this is like going parallel. So they have those needs. They know that they have those needs and they are in fact recruiting from abroad. But uh, the, the group of um, asylum seeking or refugee migrants is not put into consideration. Yeah. yeah, and that's different in those regions where we have more positive examples. They are just like, they have a more inclusive approach. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, I guess this is all we have time for. It's past yes, past probably. <laughs> so, um, um, being a, thank you very much. Very welcome. We've learned quite a few interesting <laughs> facts and this will help us think through you know, the multi-level governance structure of the uh, common European asylum system. Absolutely. So what actually is happening on, on the ground? Um, Absolutely. We now know. Absolutely. And of course, like, like from, our, from our perspective and from our knowledge we collected now with this group of migrants, of very mixed group of migrants who came 2015-16, uh, we are really curious how like the long-term effects of, of, the, of the arrival of Ukrainian refugees um, will be perceived uh, in the long term. Mm -hmm. Like um, I have in the moment, I have, as I said already, a little deja vu, uh, not only regarding this mass uh, arrival issue and how it is overwhelming for the first reception infrastructure, but also regarding the, the public narration on the labor market um, 
um, uh, uh, at attractivity, the qualifications and so on of the Ukrainian refugees. So uh, they are they are already uh, like over overwhelmingly valued as um, being our new labor migrants, and exactly the same happened in 2015 uh, regarding Syrian refugees. And um, in some of, of our interviews, there were those reflections that people reflected their disappointment that those like publicly, publicly so highly valued Syrians with their high qualifications and so on proved to, to be not so highly qualified or proved not to integrate so smoothly, so smoothly as you could have expected. Mm -hmm. So there is like a high expectation built up in the very beginning of this migration flow. I don't know why this happens. Maybe this is also on purpose to, 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 uh, to calm the population or so, I don't know. But uh, I have a deja vu and we will see uh, what happens. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. On behalf of the entire community. All right. It was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much.